Who's your supervisor, Malak? Malak Rashid. Malak Rashid. Rashid. I feel first. Okay, okay. <laughs> You're welcome, Malak. Okay, so welcome everyone. And it's a, it's a great honor to have you all here. Uh, we are running to our last lecture of this season. And we have the honor to have uh, Haisra Shahraz uh, with us today as our speaker. So what I will do, I will ask um, her to and my colleague to introduce the series briefly. And after that, I will um, uh, introduce uh, Haisra. So over to you, Hatu. Yeah, thank you, Zahia. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, Qaisara. Um, this series, for those who are joining us uh, today uh, for the first time, um, it's, a, it's a joint effort uh, by uh, Professor Zahia and myself uh, to organize this. Hello. Uh, I think Sister Hatun is frozen. Uh, Hatun, you are frozen. We'll just wait. Maybe she will come back. Yeah, not to worry. Uh, are... Oh dear. Okay, maybe maybe I should. She's dropped. She will come back. Mm -hmm. um, Hatun, are you here somewhere? She's dropped. Okay, so the series. Let me take over. The series is a project uh, Hatun and myself have started. Go ahead. Go ahead, Hatun. Welcome back. All right. <laughs> Anyway, this series includes speakers, as I said, uh, from the meeting and, uh, and beyond. Um, and the meeting point of these speakers uh, is their research on Muslim women. They're multi and interdisciplinary, uh, distinctive, innovative, and creative approaches to their fields. They deconstruct the stereotypes of Muslim women and emphasize their diversity. Uh, we have been uh, uh, having uh, nine lectures so far from the beginning of the year, and we are uh, reaching uh, a conclusion uh, uh, today. But uh, this is our first uh, phase. Inshallah, we are restarting with the new academic year. Uh, in I think I think what I'll do. Thank you, Hatun, for this introduction. Let me just so introduce. Yeah, I think I'll change. Yeah, I think I change my place. Um, I I finished what I was saying. I don't know where I have been cut <laughs> it's off. It's okay. I think I, anyway, will just, I, will, uh, I will just. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. I will introduce our speaker today. So, uh, Kaisra Shahraz, MBE, FRSA is the winner of several awards, including National Diversity Lifetime Achiever Award in 2016. In 2000, 2022, she was recognized by Manchester Finest as one of nine women making change in Greater Manchester for her work with Muslim women to transform their lives through lifelong education. In addition to this, she is a novelist, an educator, an award-winning gender and peace activist and the founding executive director of Muslim Arts and Culture Festival, which is known as MacFest UK. She has a successful writing career as an international author, novelist, and screenwriter, where she has used her literary work to explore social issues and gender issues. She has portrayed Muslim women's lives in her short stories, for example, A Pair of Jeans, and The Concubine and the Slave Catcher, and in her novels, including The Holy Woman, Typhoon and Revolt, and drama serial, The Heart, Is It?, written and produced for Pakistan television in 2003. Without further, further ado, I will invite uh, Sister Qaisra to uh, start speaking. Thank you very much for being our guest today. 
Thank you so much, uh, Sister Zahir, and thank you, Sister Khatun, uh, for inviting me to this amazing uh, lecture series. I luckily did attend last week, and I really enjoyed listening to the other speaker, and here's my turn. So just to remind people, please do mute uh, if you can. I know Barbara is a colleague of mine, and I can hear her a little <laughs> murmur, so Barbara, please, if you could mute. And I've got my assistant, Hanan, who will help me to share the PowerPoint. So Hanan, if you don't mind, please share your, uh, your screen for us, please. Thank you. Uh, the first screen, uh, the first. Uh, okay, the first slide, Hana. Just one slide show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will make it. Thank you so much. So the title is Celebrating Muslim Women, basically. Th thank you, Hanan. Yes. Next slide. So this is a quick summary of what I'm talking about. The first thing is my lifelong interest in women's life, women empowerment, celebration of Muslim women. This is the overriding factor from the age of 15 to this day, and it covers my different careers in uh, writing, education, festivals, and literary work. I'll talk briefly about my literary work where I explore women's life and issues. I'll mention, obviously, discuss the two festivals I run where women are celebrated and where women are put at the forefront. And then finally, I will go into more detail into a research project where I've had the pleasure of interviewing over 100 Muslim women across the world, exploring their lives and with the aim of debunking myths about Muslim women. Thank you, Hanan. So talking about literature, uh, I've written three novels and, and the three novels cover, I've used, uh, cover many themes, including gender issues. I've used my novels as a vehicle for exploring women's lives and particularly issues that really I felt strongly about. For example, The Holy Woman is a very powerful love story. If you like a love story, you will enjoy it. But it also covers serious women's issues. It's full of women from all backgrounds, all classes, women may, might be victims, but they also fight back. And the main overriding theme relating to women is patriarchal tyranny. In the second novel, Typhoon, which is a sequel to The Holy Woman, uh, I cover two serious themes relating to women. One is rape. I feel very strongly about the issue of rape, how devastating it is for women raped around the world, the impact on their lives. And I translated that into the context of a Muslim woman. What is it like for her? For Muslim women, many, they can't even talk about it to their family. Uh, for example, the heroine in my novel, She's been raped at the age, in, as a teenager, and to her middle age, she can never talk about it. She's still traumatized by the experience. And she says to her sister, I've had thousands of bats, but I'm still unclean. I hate this body. I want to cut it to pieces. So basically what I'm trying to tell here is that the impact on a woman's life of something like this in this context, especially as a tabooed, shameful for her to admit to a 21. The other second important theme in this book uh, is the issue of adulterous relationship to women. Imagine one woman being caught in the arms of another woman's husband. This is in a Muslim small village society. What happens to that woman? What? How does society cope with an issue like this? And if you want to find out what happens, you'll have to, of course, read the novel. The third novel was written many years later. It's uh, set in England. It's in um, set in Pakistan and covers many themes, including uh, migration, racism, mixed race marriage, intergenerational gap. It's the story of three sisters, their children, their servants. And I focus on in particular about women falling in love later in life. So those are my three novels. Thank you, Hanan. The next page, please. So then I have two collections of short stories and they've been published by my publisher who's here, Rosemary, attending with us today. The first is A Pair of Jeans. Uh, and the title is taken from a story that has made me quite famous in Germany. It's been studied in German schools for 30 odd years. And it focuses on uh, a women's issue, for example, the, uh, how women are assessed by how they are dressed, whether you, know, whether you wear traditional clothes or jeans. And, and it's, it's become quite, how shall I say, quite important in schools. And there are many other stories there that also cover some women related themes 
to do with British culture and Pakistan culture, etc. The second collection of uh, 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 I have here in front of me, the concubine and the slave catcher. This is the latest one. I'm quite proud of it. Uh, ten stories set in ten countries, covering many themes, including, for example, Hol Holocaust in Germany and uh, Poland, the migration of. Uh, overnight refugees from India to Pakistan and the black slavery in Boston and then there's a story called the concubine set in Peru 16th century Peru where this young bride moves from Spain and ends up in Lima and there she's confronted by a concubine and then the slave catcher talks about a young black maid who's been sold uh, in Boston in the 18th century so those are my two collection stories I'm sorry I'm really whizzing through everything Finally, next to you have a book, and this is quite a humbling experience. Uh, there is a book on my work, on my two novels, The Holy Woman and Typhoon. There are 17 essays. More information about those essays, and many of them cover gender issue, cultural issue. They are on my website. Website. It was edited by two academics from the University of Aligarh Muslim University in India, and it was uh, sort of published by Saroop and Sons in Delhi. So that is my literary life I sort of wanted to mention relating to women. Thank you, Hanan. So next come the major big project, which has been, how shall I say, I don't know, it's taken over my life. It's a wonderful thing, but it's also monstrous. It's grown and grown and grown. And as you can see, we have amazing slogan, spread honey, not hate. Thank you. So where did this festival come from? I'm at that age where one should retire, ease off, write another book, do other wonderful things with your family. But I got caught up with something strange happening five years ago. And I came to a decision that I wanted to set up this festival. So it came out of Manchester Arena Tag, As you know, in Manchester, we had a terrible tragedy where 22 people lost their lives. I was devastated like everybody else. But also as a Muslim, you know, life has been very, very difficult for Muslims living in the West, particularly since September the 11th. Every time you have an attack like this, there's a rise in Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred, communities become disconnected. And I came to a stand for other enough is enough. How long are we going to go on like this, where all of us are tarnished with the same brush? We are not terrorists. We are ordinary, peace-abiding, millions of us citizens of the, of the world. And I wanted to celebrate being a Muslim. I want to celebrate Islam. I want to show the positive aspect of Islam. And above all, thank you, Hanan. The next slide, please. And above all, the mission was to celebrate arts. And through the arts, we connect communities. And because I'm so committed to Muslim women's lives, I wanted to place Muslim women at the forefront of the festival. As you can see in the top picture, we have a ceremony where all the women from around the world, they welcome within their languages. I wanted to engage as an educationist. I worked for 30 odd years in colleges and schools and universities. And I thought this festival has to be hosted in schools this year and colleges. This year we hosted 17 amazing festival, uh, festival events in these places with thousands of young people. And what they're doing is celebrating art and culture and Muslim heritage. Uh, my aim was to have it hosted in all the major theatres, galleries, libraries, museums, and you name it, we've done it. And then, of course, the focus is on celebrating Muslim heritage of many, many different Muslim groups. And it's a very, very inclusive uh, festival. And that comes through that 40% of my team is non-Muslim, and four of them are Jewish, three Jewish women and one Jewish man. Thank you, Hanan. So what does the festival cover? It's not a literature festival. It covers multi-art form. Literature, for example, as you can see here. Next slide. Exhibitions, colleges. Uh, carry on, please, Hanan. This is a picture taken from one of the colleges you celebrated in. Thank you. Hanan. Uh, we cover cultural hubs which are celebrating different cultural hubs, uh, cultural heritage, art and culture of different uh, countries. For example, here we are covering Moroccan heritage. Then in the second picture, we are covering, I think, Afghani heritage. Thank you, Hanan. 
And then we have music and performance, and we use two pictures celebrating women, women performing in Bury, a, a town near Manchester, Macfest this year. And then we have these amazing women, Indonesian women, taking part in our 2020 festival uh, as part of International Women's Day at the Whitford Art Gallery. Thank you, Hanan. Photography, uh, here we have photography exhibition by one of our photographer artists that we hosted. Thank you, Hanan. History, we always cover, and thank you, Hanan. Next. So this year, so the festival has grown from being based in Manchester for three weeks, then went on to become a month, then two months. And this year is, is spread over eight months. Why is this? It's because you, you can't host this festival within a week or two. For example, we want to celebrate youth festival. We want to host all those schools and colleges. How can you do that within a week? So we have we hosted in February Youth Festival. In March, we hosted a Muslim Women's Festival. I'll talk more about that. In a, as a Muslim festival, we want to celebrate Ramadan. We want to celebrate Eid. And that, of course, varies every year. So at this moment in time, we're in the middle of a Ramadan festival. And next week, please join us for Indonesian uh, Eid party on Sunday digital and we celebrate an Eid Indonesian festival in March. Looking forward to the future, we have the African Heritage in July, we have Arab Heritage Week festival in September and we will have international festival uh, with many different, uh, including from America, from Malaysia. The picture you see of a woman is one of the travelers. We're going to uh, explore the life of two women traveler from India, from Turkey in 19th century England and what they found as they experienced. And and then finally, you have a picture of Muslim Women's Art Foundation that I will speak in a minute. Thank you, Hanan. So it's an award-winning uh, festival. We won the Queen's Volunteer Award by the Queen herself. We gained commendation uh, certificate from the University of Manchester Making a Difference Award. We won the finest award for the Leading Light and we won two more. So it's an exceedingly good festival I'm proud to say and we have achieved and we've made a difference in connecting communities and bringing people together thank you Hanan and we we have lo we've lots and lots of partners including with other festivals thank you Hanan these are all our partners thank you thank you so in the first year we were hosted in Manchester mainly and the vision was always big for me. First local, Manchester, then national, and then international. So now we are national, and these are some of the towns we've been hosted in, where they've hosted events, either a full-blown festival for a day or an odd event. And the premise behind this was, well, this was my idea, wherever there is Islamophobia, there needs to be a MACFest. Here is a flyer of our previous festival. Thank you, Hanan. And then when COVID came along two years ago, I grabbed the opportunity and Zoom was a lifeline, a lifeline for us because in the previous live festival, we couldn't really afford to bring many writers from abroad, only the odd one or occasional one. Suddenly I had the world at my fingertip and we could actually reach out anywhere. So these are some of the uh, countries we've hosted, but the best thing about it was it enabled all those artists, performers, speakers from other countries to have a chance to take part with us and to celebrate their world. So these are pictures of some of the things we've done. Thank you, Hanan. This is our social media. Please do follow us, join us. We have a YouTube channel covering two years, all our events there. And we are hoping if Sister Zahir allows us to put this event on our YouTube channel so you can watch it later. Thank you, Hanan. Okay, so now comes my third big initiative, which I am proud of, it's hard work. So what is this then, Muslim Women's Art Foundation? Why, why, why do we have it? I was sitting on this idea for two years, and why was this? Um, it was because I, although I put women at the forefront of MACFest and I explored their live, we hosted, we did everything we could, I just felt it still wasn't enough. N not even our website was a space to celebrate women. So my idea was to actually provide a space, a platform to celebrate and explore the lives of creative women around the world, local, national, and international. And last uh, May, 
2021, I set up the company and we set up the foundation. We now have a website you can go on and we program this festival. And let me tell you a little bit more about it. So I'd asked myself, what is the purpose of this? What, what are we going to do with this foundation? How are we going to have the capacity to manage this? So then I came up with two ideas. One was the idea to celebrate and elevate Muslim women, explore their lives. Well, we run a festival already, so we will have a Muslim women's art festival itself on its own. And then the second purpose was to reach out to those women who are not visible to most people, uh, who are the creative women from around the world, that we would find them, we would showcase them. So the premise being that often we host the women who are already doing well, who are already visible, who are already achievable. There are millions of women around the world who, have, who are being creative, either in the art, embroidery, creative, carpet weaving. They never have a chance, they're never discovered. So that was the second mission of this. So what did we do? This picture is taken at the Whitford Art Gallery the day we launched it and we just cut in a cake. On that day, we celebrated our Northwest local Women's Art Festival. We hosted 75 women artists, performers, singers, poets, dramatists, uh, you name it, photographers. Uh, we did everything. And then two weeks after that, we went around the world where we hosted photographers, writers, singers, uh, how shall I say, chef, drama teacher, and even an Egyptian ballerina. Thank you, Hannah. Next. So this is our all our social media. Please do come and check and you know find out what we're doing and we're still developing a new idea which we'll explore next year and i've already had a word with sister zahia we will maybe have a conference on muslim women creative linked with the university so it's something we are hoping to explore thank you hanan how am i doing for time i'm i'm raising ahead but okay so this is the main thing i want to concentrate on and i want to give proper time to this so this is research into Muslim women's lives from around the world. I've been fascinated by this idea because I come from Pakistan, a developing country, I arrived here at the age of nine, and I believe I'm a product of this world. And I was just talking about it to my father yesterday. I said, look, I am what I am. Whatever I've done is thanks to England. It's thanks to you, father, coming here. It's thanks to the education. It's thanks to the opportunity. I would not have had any of this if I was living in a small remote village in Pakistan. And so that fascination with women's life uh, has always been there. The other thing for me is equality. I feel very seriously, how shall I say, uh, passionate about making a difference to other women. I feel I'm one of the lucky ones, like sisters are here, like sisters Khatun. We've got everything going for us. But what about those women who don't have those opportunities that we have? So for me, it's an equality issue. We as women can make a difference. And I've been doing that over the years, like with I've been teaching for 35 years, involved with lifelong learning, teaching women, and just telling them how to write their name can make a difference. And then empowering women. I have a team of volunteers and my own, many are women, and they're not professional. I have mentored them, I've supported them, I've trained them, and have led them into a new world, basically. And so in our, in our own little way, we can make a difference. So where did this project come from? It came from the fact that as my publishing took off, I was traveling the world to many places where books were coming out in Indonesia or Turkey or India or Pakistan. There were festivals that were attending. I was always fascinated by talking to other women to see what they were doing, what their lives were like. And then suddenly I had an idea a few years back. I thought, well, why not make the most of this opportunity? Why not actually interview women properly and get a feel of what their lives are like. And it, it resulted in, would you believe, 32 hours of tape recording of interviews. 32 hours, can you believe it? It's hell of a lot. The original idea that there would be a book out of it, but what happened at the end? Nothing. I had so many other things going on uh, and the thought of going through those 32 hours was just phenomenal. So I left it at that. So to be honest with you, um, it's a major work I've done, but the end product still hasn't come. Hanan, thank you. Next page, please. So where did I go? Which other countries I visited? L let me explain these pictures here. We wanted to celebrate the, uh, the people we hosted this year. So you've got Enzi at the top, 
She's an Egyptian ballerina, a Pakistani poet next to her. The lady at the bottom in red is an Indonesian publisher. The lady with the red beat is a Yemeni photographer we hosted. So the cities I visited, India, Germany, Pakistan, Morocco, UK, Surabaya, Dubai, and Singapore, these are the countries that I sort of interviewed women from. Thank you. And those are the cities. Next, Hanan. So what were the topics? What were, you know, what was I going to talk to them about? So I had to have some sort of an idea. So I thought it would be interesting, fascinating to find out about their family life, for example, what was it like? What form did it take? What was the home background? It's like in my family, my father always encouraged me into the world of education. My father pushed me into the world of work. He said, I remember uh, finishing my teaching degree and I thought, oh, I'll wait for my teaching job. And my father said, what are you doing? Are you gonna wait for five months? Go on, get, get a job, find something else. And I actually did that. And this was my home environment, but then there are other home environments where women are not given that opportunity or maybe actually discouraged from work, for example. I also covered class. Class is a big factor that affected many women's life. Education, a major big, uh, you know, you know, it affects, transforms women's life and it has a huge impact on women. Uh, work, obviously, clothing, veil, hijab. Uh, as you know, the West um, world, generally defines Muslim women by how they're dressed. And I'm just fed up of this, uh, this uh, premise that you know, we are being defined by our clothing. And I often say to non-Muslims, so please leave us alone. Let us dress the way we want to go beyond the veil. I talked about marriage. What was it like for them? If they had a divorce, could they remarry again? We discussed divorce. Was it ugly divorce? Was it straightforward? Was it easy? Was it not? We talked about cultures and customs that, are, that affected their lives and had an impact on a daily basis. And then for the women in, in Europe, for example, in England and in Germany, the issue of identity was very, very important. You know, I'm Pakistani in Pakistan, but I'm suddenly British. I've got a new life totally with two kinds of identity, cultural, language, way of life. So all of this sort of defined who these women were. Thank you, Hanan. So who, when it came to the background of women that I interviewed, so who were these women? First, I'll talk about the pictures. At the top, we have Kubra from Germany. She was a famous writer we hosted. Next to her is the Indonesian performer from, and we're gonna meet her next week, in fact, Sunday. Below her in the scarf is Hale from, uh, from Iran. She is a, uh, a lecturer at the University of MMU, and she presented lovely panels for us on Persian cookery and heritage and the Silk Road. And next to her is Shireen, the Malaysian lady who hosted and is a TV presenter and who hosted a Malaysian cuisine. So the women I interviewed along my study were housewives, actors, politicians, teachers, maids, businesswomen, academics, scientists, fashion designer, journalist, tea picker, publisher, translator. Basically, I was in the hands of my hosts, the people I, I received help from. I said to them, look, I want a wide variety of women from all background, all classes that you can, you know, enable me to meet. And, and whoever they sort of connected me to, I ended up interviewing them. Thank you, Hanan. So now we come to the findings. So these are crucial and uh, they're important. Obviously, if I had uh, managed to go through my 32 hours of uh, a, a transcription of my recording, I would have all the findings. And then out of that, I would have found the key findings and they would have been accurate. Here, what I've got is what I'm remembering from that time, to be honest with you. It's what sticks in my mind, some episodes, certain themes that stick in my head. So the first one I have, it, I was delighted to know and, and, and come up with was this idea. And it totally debunked this myth that all Muslim women are victims or they're oppressed or they don't have any autonomy. None of that is, it's all nonsense. What I discovered from interviewing these hundred women from all walks of life was this, they were unique individual. They were a product of their environment, of their geographical location, whether they lived in a city or in a small village, a part of their family life, education that they had gained, whether it's primary, secondary, or higher education, the position in the family, whether a daughter or a daughter-in-law or a mother or the third child, or mm -hmm. etc., the work opportunity they had or they didn't have, or did they even think about work? And then the local customs. 
all these factors shape a woman's life. Now, out of this uh, bullet point, I'm going to share with you one finding. In India, I traveled to five cities and I first interviewed women in Chennai. Then I went up to Coimbatore where we had some Indian friends and I got, I was connected to a group of women and they turned out to be few of them from the Bora community. Amazing women, have leading wonderful life, business women, you know, just having a good time in every way. And when I finished my interview and I was about to leave, this interview took place in a bookshop. They said, Kessler, Kessler, we've got something else to share with you. And I said to them, what is it? What is it you want to tell me? They said, Kessler, we've all been circumcised. And I said, what? I was horror stricken, circumcised? in India, what's going on? And then they explained, and then I realized what had happened. They were followers, uh, they were from the Bora community. They were followers of a spiritual leader who was originally from Yemen. Obviously Yemen is near Africa. And of course in Africa, you do have this tra tradition of female circumcision. So all these women for cultural reason were actually uh, circumcised. Then I went up to Mumbai and I came across many other women. And out of that group, there were again, two Bora women. And I brought up this issue with them. And one woman, uh, the wife of a doctor, actually, she said, yes, we, I've been circumcised and so has my daughter. And I said to her, how does this fit in? Your husband's a doctor. She said, but this is the way of life. You know, we accept it. This is part of our culture, our custom. And that sort of brought it home to me that really cultural traditions are very, very strong. And no matter who you are, what you do, they still end up shaping a woman's life or your life to some extent. So now second bullet point, I am, I found that most of the women I interviewed were lead, oh, sorry. Okay. Most women interviewed had access to education. Oh, no, sorry. This is another one. No, Hanan, go back. Last slide, yes. Second bullet point, most women interviewed were leading good lives and they had positive lives. They had full freedom to lead their lives the way they wished. And this is especially the case in Singapore. I've never met women who were leading fantastic life on, on divorce, on marriage and remarriage, on education, on work, on lifestyle, economic prosperity, everywhere. They, they, they were just amazing women having amazing time everything was positive for them and then number three is clothing and this was a major sort of a topic which I explored everywhere it's a topic that most Muslim women are defined by so I will share with you some of my findings first of all in Indonesia we found that all the women in I had spoken to uh, were wearing the hijab, the headscarf, underneath they wore the top and they were tight jeans. So that was generally the fashion of the country. And that's the way it was. In Surabaya, a city, I had the pleasure of meeting this famous actress. And um, she uh, w was very glamorous, very pretty. And I asked her this question. I said, what about hijab for you? She said, I, I wore a hijab and when I was interviewed by the, the people for, for the TV people, they said, we want you to look glamorous and we don't want you to wear a hijab. And, and the next minute, this lady touched her scalp and her scalp actually moved. I, 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 was, I couldn't believe it. Her scalp had moved. What was it? She had actually, she was actually wearing a wig over her hair. And then she explained, she said, they wanted me to look glamorous. Okay, I look glamorous, but I will not show my hair. So this lady was wearing a wig to hide her own hair in the way that you have some Jewish women doing that. So that was something I want to share with you from Indonesia. In Pakistan, for example, and India, uh, the clothing is different. Uh, for example, they wear traditional clothing, uh, shalwar kameez, trousers, long baggy uh, dress over the top. But in Pakistan, for example, very fashionable clothing, fashion trends are changing by the day. And then in terms of headgear, normally they don't wear a scarf on the head. It's normally draped at the side as I'm doing at the moment. Uh, and that's the way it is. But then I want to share with you also this little uh, sort of a thing, uh, this episode that I share with many people that I often talk about clothing is it, I come from Lahore, a city of uh, in Pakistan. It's the old city of uh, India. And we have a famous mall road there in Lahore. One end of the mall road, it actually starts in the inner city and the other end ends up in the outer suburb in, in, in near, how shall I say, um, near the airport. 
Now, in the inner city area of this road, uh, the scene is totally different. It's congested, there's traffic, and the women, I'm talking about women here, they're all dressed in conservative fashion. They're fully robed with, with a hijab, with a chadar around their shoulder, etc. As you go traveling up the road, the scene changes. It becomes more leafy, less congested, more beautiful, more attractive. Well, what happens to the women? The women too change because the class has changed by that road. And when you get to the other end, often it's the well-off women, the well-educated women, women from the upper classes, and their clothing changes with it. You'll see sleeveless dresses there. There is no head covering there. And even the trousers, the latest fashion is that they wear these tight trousers. And, and they, they're like collots, uh, they, they're above the ankle. So they're actually showing their ankle. So this is what I want to share with you about Pakistan and clothing and traditions. As you can see, every country is different. It follows its own culture, its own fashion, and everybody thinks they're modestly dressed according to their own cultural norms. Now I'll come to Morocco, another country I love, I visited. My next novel is set in Morocco and France. And I actually stayed with for two weeks as part of my research, not just for this project, but really for my novel. And I got to talk to many women about certain, you know, everything what I'm talking about here. And clothing wise, there was a division. As you know, Morocco is North Africa. North Africa was colonized by the French. And you still have that dichotomy of lives between the European way of life and the Arab style. So if you go into the mountains to the, uh, the Berber villages, you see many women uh, dressed in traditional clothing with fully robed with, with headscarf. And then I spoke to women who were teachers, academics in, in Rabat, my host. They were speaking French all the time and their dress was totally Western and some were showing their legs as well. So you can see the difference. Okay, number four, this is about work. So I'll focus on work. Many women in Pakistan and India didn't work, not only because they didn't have the opportunities, but also it was dictated by so cultural norms and home situation and society's views about women working. I'll, I will unpack that for you. So for example, in Pakistan, at the upper end, women who have access to education belong to that sort of, class where women are, have freedom, they have money, they are well educated and often they do work. They work in the film industry, in the media, they work in the medical field or in teaching these kind of profession. And in Pakistan, God bless Pakistan, compared with Afghanistan, they have actually a quota of women in politicians. So there's many women politicians. So that's the upper end of society. Then at the lower end, you have what you have, as in many African countries, South American countries, Asian countries, you have millions of workers, home workers. They're the maids, they're the home helpers, they're the washerwomen who for economic reason are forced into work. They have no choice. They work in people's home. Then in the middle, you have nothing, barely anything for women. So you have women at the top really into work, and have the opportunity and work in very good profession and have the background for it. You have women at the bottom of the class system, economic disadvantage. They are really into work for no reason because they have to work to feed their family, to feed themselves. The women in the, uh, in the middle sector, the lower income middle-class women, there are a number of factors affecting them. First of all, work. Remember Pakistan is a developing country. Uh, unemployment is very high. So if there's unemployment high and there are not many jobs, who's gonna get them first, the men? So first of all, there are fewer jobs for women, average work. In England, I can find work in any field. In Pakistan, there are fewer fields to enter into. So that's one factor. The second factor is really the cultural norms and the home situations. As you know, in many Muslim societies, families are very protective of their women and their daughters, their wives. Uh, and why are they protected? Even in the West, as you know, women, you know, are targeted, they're physically abused or they're harassed sexually at work or in other places. So in Pakistan, that fear is there that if a woman went and worked with other men, you know, she might uh, get the wrong look or somebody might do something, they're afraid. So that also adds to, to a barrier for those women into the world of work. Now, my drama serial, I don't know if I managed to mention that. I have two drama serials. The first drama serial 
talks about how important it, it, it was, it's set in Pakistan, it was made for Pakistan, and I used it as a vehicle to explore the issue of dyslexia on women and work. In the second drama serial, I used it as a vehicle to explore the issue of domestic violence, how women can be abused in the household and people don't even bat an eyelid because it's sort of accepted as normal, which is, is not normal. And the other theme I've explored is raising awareness about cancer. So that's by the by, I just wanted to mention that as I was going along. And then we have fifth one. This is an interesting one to share. Most women were against being a co-wife or their husband taking a second wife. As you know, in Islam, a man can take a second wife or a third wife, but there's a rational behind it. You take a second wife if there's a reason for it. For example, the other wife can't have a child or there's mental illness or if the wife allows. So these are that's the rationale behind taking second wife. So all the women I actually interviewed, and it was interesting talk, none of them uh, were in agreement with this. Their country did not have many marriages where there were second wives. It wasn't the norm, absolutely not the norm. But then I want to share one example where, which was quite funny in Indonesia, uh, during conversation, this conversation came up about a uh, co-wife and, and I said, what is a co-wife? They said, marriage under the table. I said, what is this marriage under the table? She said, this is when a man say he falls in love and instead of quitting, uh, committing you know, adultery, etc., he secretly quietly marries so he doesn't offend his first wife and he does it in a respectable manner, but it's called marriage under the table. And then she gave me this funny story. There's a famous restaurant in Jakarta uh, well loved by everybody and suddenly this uh, owner of this uh, restaurant married another woman and what did the women do those women of the families who used to visit they boycotted that restaurant they said they told the men we're not going into that restaurant because that man has taken another wife and it ended up as sort of a little news on there so what i'm trying to say here is in indonesia for example there's a law against taking a second wife they don't encourage it thank you hanan next one so identity issue I've already explained to you that is particularly relevant to Muslim women living in the West. For example, the woman, Kurdish woman I interviewed in Germany, for example, uh, she was from Kurdish, she was now German. Her daughter was more German than herself because she's second generation. Her life had totally changed because she was living in a different environment. And of course her home environment had changed and she felt less secure. She felt isolated as you will find. Uh, there were cultural barriers, there were linguistic barriers. So she wasn't fully leading a happy life although they were more economically prosperous. And, and there's plenty to talk about this, but I don't have time to, uh, today, I'm afraid. Next one, uh, uh, number two, most women interviewed had access to education, but this was dictated by the economic background of the family, culture, and class. Yes. So the, first of all, in Pakistan, I'll use that as an example. Education is not free, you have to pay for it. If you have a few children, you have to pay for all of those children and people do. And in Pakistan, uh, there's really drive, although the literacy rate is not high, there is a drive to educate women. And I'm really proud of this. And I've been to many universities and given lectures there. And in the University of Gujarat, one lecturer was telling me proudly that they had 89% of the higher education students were women. Now the situation is this in Pakistan, you have more women educated beyond their means, overeducated. But, the, uh, but the, the problem now is that they couldn't find young men of the same caliber for education because they were overeducated. This is one scenario. These are the women who have access to it. What about a young girl living in a prior small village where there's only a primary school? How far can she go to another college? How far can she go to university? This will be dictated by whether the family can afford it, whether they will let her go out to another city to live, to go to, uh, you know, to take part in education. So all these factors do affect. Then number three, all women interviewed in Indonesia had love marriage. I was really <laughs> intrigued by this. All the women I sort of interviewed in India had arranged marriages and same for Pakistan, but all every single woman in Indonesia, 33 of them, from the humble three tea makers, uh, tea, no, tea pickers, uh, to the professor at university had love marriage. Now I'll come to the cultural norms. I've already talked about 
uh, the Arabic European culture and uh, the, the division between the two. Uh, I'll mention the motorcycles in Indonesia. In Pakistan, for example, you very rarely see a woman on a cycle, never mind a motorcycle. It's for cultural reason, it's for modesty reason, but also the traffic is so bad, a woman wouldn't want to do that. But you know what I discovered in Indonesia, 60% of the motorcyclists were women and the roads were gridlocked by these motorcyclists. So it's quite an eye opener. And the next thing, I, uh, number five, women of the middle and upper class had better access to education, they took up work, and they were more in control of their lives. Finally, number six, mixed views about women remarrying, an opportunity for them to do so if all the right. I'll share two examples. One was from three examples. In Pakistan, I met a young woman, still young, three daughters, widowed. And I said to her, would she like to remarry? And I could see in her eyes that she would welcome that idea. In the same room was a mother-in-law and she was horrified at the idea. She said, how can she remarry? She had three young growing daughters. How can we let our granddaughters go into another man's home? And that was it. She said, she has everything she needs, comfort, economic means, uh, you know, she can go out to work, she has a home, she doesn't need to marry another man. So that was it, basically. I spoke to a Iranian woman in England, and she said, in their culture, very rarely, for the same reason, like, if you have children, it becomes more difficult for women to remarry, especially if you have daughter, about, or, or they would have to leave their children and remarry. Now, in the case of a Somali woman, that was a different example, totally. In Somali, as you know, uh, some of you might know, unlike Bangladesh, there is a culture of second marriage in men taking more than one wife. So there's a similar culture of women remarrying. So this young woman informed me that in their country, they often encourage women to remarry. She said, if they don't remarry, she'll be after my husband. <laughs> she was saying, basically, women protect their own marriages by getting other women married off. So this was like a joke for her, but it showed the acceptability in that country of women remarry. In India, it was the same situation. Remarrying was more difficult for women compared with men. Finally, uh, I've got here, work was of importance to most women interviewed in Indonesia. 33 of them were all working, including the three tea pickers. So that is almost the end of my <laughs> uh, key findings, my presentation. Hanan, can you take us onto the next slide? So thank you everybody for listening and I can expand more if you want to, you can ask me questions fully now, but later. And if you want more detail about my books or work, you can go on my website and follow me on Twitter, just as you can do for MACRES and for Muslim Women's Art Foundation. Thank you so much for your time. Over to you, Sister Zahia. This is excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you have presented us with a wealth of information uh, which are all, um, I think, I, I, don't, I, I don't know where to start. I mean, there's so much, there's literature, there is uh, uh, culture, there is arts, and there's also life, uh, social life. It's really a treasure of information you have opened for us here. And I'm sure everyone here will find uh, what they are working on. Basically, you touched on everything. You are you are what we call a mausua encyclopedia here. Oh, no, no, no. Well no, done. I Thank just, you so much. No, I just feel I skimmed everything, but I managed to. Well, move. well, everything is documented. We have so many um, links that you have presented us with, mm. and this is great. This is great. Okay. So over you. to all of you. Do you have any questions? Um, I just want to to add something. Um, uh, you see, Kaisara, I have lived uh, for five years in Manchester in the 90s. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, my lovely sister. Uh -huh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, and I was, uh, and I just was, as you were, were telling the stories of the MacFest and all what you've been doing, I was saying, oh, well, how much uh, such a thing would have been great yes. if I were, if it was happening while I was there, because mm -hmm. I could see how much Manchester was full with energy and with, with, with young people who are really uh, uh, thriving for, for any activity that, would, uh, uh, that will speak to them, especially mm -hmm. Muslim young, young uh, women and men. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really happy that something like uh, what you're doing now is even going beyond Manchester itself mm -hmm. and, so and abroad. <laughs> No, thank you. We love to host you from uh, Saudi Arabia. We did have uh, one woman from last year. <laughs> okay.
thank you. Thank you so much. You are really adding to the uh, uh, multicultural uh, aspect of Manchester, but th th this, this festival itself, Muckfest, is really like a landmark and a meeting point of, of many Muslim cultures where Absolutely. everyone can feel at home. So Absolutely. I hope we will all have a chance to be there uh, and participate or contribute in a way or another. I mean, you, and, and obviously we will share this lecture with the rest of our network uh, and hopefully your network also will expand as a result. Thank you. Uh, Does anyone have a question? I just wanted to add where Please. I forgot to mention, uh, it's not just connecting uh, host community, Muslim communities. The other mission was to connect our different oh, Muslim definitely. communities. So when did, for example, Pakistani meet the Nigerians or the Nigerian meet the mm -hmm. Turks or the Turks meet the Somali, this doesn't happen. So the festival aims to bring all of us as different Muslim groups together and get rid of our divisions, our racism, our you know lack of understanding. And we have achieved that. So in a way we become like a big family of all different cultures. And we are totally diverse. We are all different within our own cultural grouping. Would you agree sisters are here? I agree, totally agree. That's what I try to teach in my Women and Gender course, that uh, there's no such thing as a homogenous Muslim person, whether Absolutely. men or women. We, as you have explained uh, with a lot of detail, we all come from different backgrounds. There are so many factors that contribute into the making of every person. So there's no such thing as a homogenous Muslim world yeah. or as a homogenous Muslim woman and um, you are doing a great work. I think I think this is really, it's not only, I think the, your, your audience will not just be the Muslims, but the non-Muslims who yes. want to clear their mind from uh, preconceived views and stereotypes, especially those diffused by the media. Yes. And, and here you are giving the true picture and allowing people of Muslims from different countries, backgrounds, genders to express themselves and say who they are. I think this is really what we need beyond uh, the, the, the constructed image, we want to see the true image. And by giving voice to all these people, that's how they can convey their true image. And the diversity uh, of your, of your uh, palette is, is really what gives you more power. When I looked at the slides, you touched on so many areas. Uh, I was really uh, uh, surprised to see even Amazigh women from Kabylie. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Did you? Oh gosh, we did. Yes, we did. with the orange dresses. These are from the region I come from. Yeah, oh really, mashallah. Yeah. Oh yeah. no, uh, we've been learning ourselves. I'm telling you, it's been educational for all of us. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Hanan is there. Hanan, do you want to add anything? Uh, how you found it? Hanan is from Morocco. She's taken part mm -hmm. in it, and she's presented Moroccan. Uh, uh, and then Asma will speak after. Asma, please speak immediately after Hanan. Go ahead. So who is it? Esma or me? No, 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 no. Yeah. I just wanted so, to. Yeah. Let me share with you my experience uh, uh, that I'm part of the team because uh, we are all Muslim and non-Muslim together as a team first. Now imagine the whole festival like Macbeth or Muslim Arts Foundation because, we, we, because you, you know, uh, for me it was, was a really, uh, meeting Kaysara, an inspirational woman first, uh, and came from another country uh, and uh, be part of, uh, of the group like this Muslim and no Muslim give me such a power just, just to express myself, to, to build my confidence, to develop my skills, my abilities, because imagine I couldn't speak anywhere when I met Kaysara two years ago. So she bring me with other people like to develop our skills, our skills also. And uh, what can I say? Is this such experience, a great experience for us? And also because we meet uh, uh, artists, uh, painter, uh, you know, uh, dancer. Uh, it's is it's it's such uh, courses, it's such uh, educational, educational, mm -hmm. uh, um, you, you know, uh, in in a, in a great way to learn. Uh, so. For me, uh, it's it's a really it's a really I'm so proud to be part of, uh, of her 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 uh, team, and uh, what can I say? I'm just grateful uh, to give me this opportunity and uh, to express myself also. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Hanan, you are an asset, amazing asset for us. Without you, it wouldn't be the same, Marshall. <laughs> Asma, could you un unmute yourself? You don't want? You do? All right. Can you not? You not can't you. unmute? It's not working. <laughs> Oh, there you are. That's okay. Thank you. Um, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, thank you for a, for a fascinating talk, Gesra. Um, my name's Asma Khan, and I am a researcher at Cardiff University. Um, oh, and um, yeah, I'm really pleased to hear about MacFest. I think it's a uh, yeah, it's a fascinating initiative. I can't believe I haven't heard of you guys before. Yeah, we're hoping um, to get to uh, Cardiff, by the way. We are hoping for a Cardiff MacFest, so we were keen to connect with you then. <laughs> I, yeah, I work at the Centre for the Study of Islam in the UK. Um, right. So uh -huh. this is the exactly the kind of thing that we're, we're, we're interested in working with our local community although I'm based up north myself um it's fascinating talk I've done uh my PhD research was on economically inactive Muslim women in great in greater Manchester uh, I did my research in Cheatham Hill so I, I'd love to yeah I'd love to be able to 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 um to meet and, and and to kind of discuss our shared interests as well I think that'd be fascinating um and my my, my picky bit is always okay celebrate culture and um uh, achievements but remember the socio-economic uh, drop against which Muslim women are operating in a minority mm -hmm. context but you do that beautifully throughout your presentation so I can see yeah I can see that you take a real intersectional approach in your work Um, no specific questions at the moment yeah just uh, just uh, yeah it's a pleasure to have heard you speak um, this afternoon and I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much. I think I discovered you today on Twitter and I, when I read your bio, I thought I need to connect because you are talking about Muslims, aren't you? Yes, uh, yeah. And we have Sophie Gillett. Is she part of your team? That's uh, Sophie Gillett, Ray. Yes, she's, she's our off, centre director. I approached her last year to present something and she's off this year. So we'll definitely be connected. We'll, I'll be in touch with you, inshallah. Okay, that's fine. Well, I, just wonder, I just wonder within your research how much um, input you have from uh, Muslim women who have converted to Islam. Yes, we have definitely. Uh, one Every year we have hosted Muslim women converts and it's amazing listening to their lives. Absolutely. You go back the previous year, you'll see it on YouTube channel. We, we do that every year and it's amazing, riveting talk. Absolutely. Okay, that's, that's and while, while you were talking, suddenly I remember I forgot to mention the disadvantaged women. Uh, we are hosting Afghani women this coming year. The other women I'm going to be hosting as part of festival because they are the disadvantaged, the invisible women. We want to provide a platform to them. And I was saying to the organizer, look, I don't want just your famous artists who already have opportunity, who know how to get there out to the outside world. I want to reach out to those women who are totally isolated, totally disadvantaged to provide a platform. So I'm really, really keen uh, to make sure that we showcase aspiring local disadvantaged as well as those who are equally doing well. And it's an equality issue for me. The whole thing is, is about equality. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any, anyone else would like to speak or ask a question? Um, uh, Mushtaq, uh, Mushtaq al Haq just commented, said that he has read uh, one of your novels. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Well, you have some fans already in, in the audience. Do you want to say anything about it, Mushtaq? or to say something about yourself? And mute yourself. Yes. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, hello. I have read uh, novel Love's Fury, uh, but you have not mentioned it in your uh, list of books. Uh, I am uh, based in uh, Kashmir, uh, the Indian administered uh, Kashmir. Okay. Uh, and uh, Professor Abdul Rahim Kidwai has been a, a mentor uh, oh really? So, okay. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, I'm aware uh, about some of your work. So I just want to ask one question. Uh, uh, you have been writing about women, patriarchy, misogyny, as I could read from uh, this Love Fury one novel uh, about of yours. So uh, how do you see? Because uh, within the uh, Islamic or Muslim discourse now, we have Islamic feminists who are trying to reinterpret. Islam in a more gender just manner. So uh, do you reflect something uh, about that in your writings or is there uh, uh, a kind of an alternative uh, in this uh, religious kind of interpretation through which women uh, can, uh, their lives can become much uh, better? That's precisely my question. 
Okay, so at the moment I'm stuck on two novels which are not finished and they're on different topics so I can't really answer that question in that way but all I can say is that I'm devoted to women's lives, devoted to raising awareness whether it's negative or positive but I'm also aware as a Muslim woman our world is different from the Western woman's world. So I always come up with this. I look, we are feminists, we care about women's life, but really we are coming from a different platform, from a different perspective, mm -hmm. because you know our way of life is different, our perspectives are different, our values are different. So therefore my, my view on certain items would be different, say from a colleague who's non-Muslim from America, depending on her experience. So I, I'm not uh, an academic, I haven't really gone into much research. I've just been so busy with these festivals. So I don't know how much I can offer you more detail on that aspect. But what I can say is Muslim women's lives matter a lot to me, they really do. And above all, the slogan we have for the festival, for the foundation, elevating and celebrating Muslim women. I'm just fed up of the stereotyping that Muslim women have, fed up of the, uh, you know, seeing them in a negative way. I remind people, say, so look, okay, you have problem in Afghanistan, you have problem in Saudi Arabia for women, but the rest of the world, for example, you know, women are having amazing life. Why are you, why are you sort of brushing all the other women under the same brush? On the other hand, I am aware that it varies from home to home, from culture to culture, from society to society. So we can never forget those women. So there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we can only do what we can, basically, and uh, and I believe women together can help each other, but the men have a lot to do with. I am where I am because of my father. He encouraged me into the world of work. He encouraged me to go into education. I have achieved all of this because I have a very supportive husband at home. He loves, so it's the home environment, patriarchal environment at home has also a lot to do with it. There are homes, for example, in Pakistan where women, uh, you know, when a stranger man come into the household, they suddenly have to exit into another room. Although the woman might be a grandmother's age and yet she has to go out because he's only 23. I said, what nonsense is this? Well, it happened to me, for example, I'm giving you an example. Uh, I'm, I'm at a later stage in my life. I'm not a young chick anymore, as you can see. Uh, and But the culture of our country, as you know, is that it varies from household to household that men and women, when you have strange men, uh, you know, they go into other rooms and the women normally leave modestly, go into another room. But here's me, famous woman on the internet everywhere. And yet I'm being told off, told by a young nephew to say, auntie, can you go into the other room? For who? For this young man who was like my son. So for a certain dichotomy, which I feel is, is a bit strange for me, especially coming out of, from the West. But then you have to accept that we have to respect the culture of that place, of the, uh, of the home and the values that we have. So I'm always trying to keep a balancing act for myself as well. <laughs> okay. Well, you, you're very strong to, <laughs> to bear this experience and to, and to survive it without uh, protesting. <laughs> <laughs> you are doing amazing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have accepted it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, 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 believe, I believe that you have to, that we have to change the, uh, these norms and traditions that are not necessarily uh, following any kind of rule. I mean, the respect no, no. of elderly women is... Uh, yes. is, is, is is at the forefront of Islamic uh, tradition. So yeah. um, I think that, that we have to, yes. <laughs> to be less modest. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think it's pat patriarchalism, control of women. I don't know what it is, but it varies from place to place. <laughs> It's, it's actually patriarchy with its uh, million faces uh, that actually transform across regions and cultures. But I, if, if I may, Mushtaq, um, Mushtaq al Haq, if I may, in terms of Islamic feminism, it's a discourse that is trying actually to empower women uh, through a, a better understanding of their faith, uh, because patriarchy has also disfigured Islam. Uh, the negative side of Islam that is propagated across the world is actually the, pa the patriarchal uh, rendition of this faith. And a lot of women are actually in, uh, in the dark as to uh, how, how much rights and what are the rights that this faith has granted them. And uh, 
uh, eventually a lot of Muslim women uh, following the, the current views that are circulating in the media, etc., end up believing that actually this, this faith is against women or is a misogynist faith, etc., etc. So I think if we can uh, manage to, to differentiate between patriarchy and religion, that will be a great achievement. My, my colleague Hatun is, is an Islamic feminist herself and she could perhaps follow on this. She's, she's trying to be modest. <laughs> um, but I, I understand that um, anyway, Mushtaq al Haqi uh, has got uh, our ad through Musawa, so he must be already aware of the work of Musawa on the um, on 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 the uh, on the ground and how they try to bring uh, uh, women inter Muslim women interpretation into the uh, the discourse of uh, of male do dominant male uh, interpretation of uh, Islamic laws, especially when it comes to Islam, to the family laws, but but also uh, on other fronts that are controversial that where where you can't see the equality because there is. Um, uh, with Islamic feminism, um, the belief uh, about uh, equality is is there, um, or, or the, 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 the first uh, point of their, uh, their mandate is that Islam has granted equality uh, and justice to, uh, to all Muslims, um, male and female. And, but the practice and uh, the male interpretation of, uh, of Islamic uh, uh, of Allah's words have uh, brought us where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, more uh, women uh, educated in Islamic uh, 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 literature and Islamic uh, 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 verses, then they are more able to, um, uh, to answer back. To the and to challenge the mm -hmm. status quo of uh, of the interpretations that uh, bring women or uh, drove Muslim women always to the second uh, seat or the back seat or or the other room. <laughs> 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 uh, so anyway, uh, I think you, uh, and our our platform is part of it. I mean, we are here uh, trying to. To give the opportunity for, for for this discourse from different angles. Uh, now the angle of Faisal was uh, was here. She was giving uh, us the the uh, the lived realities of of Muslim women. Uh, that is very important in understanding in mm -hmm. or in uh, 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 create uh, in building the arguments for. Uh, for uh, Muslim women vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the male interpretation of uh, what is right and wrong or what is halal and haram. Lived realities uh, is, is, is a different uh, uh, answer to, uh, mm -hmm. to the strict literary mm -hmm. uh, uh, scripts of, uh, of mm -hmm. ancient uh, male writers. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, anyone else has a question or a comment? We have some people uh, just uh, praising, commenting. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to say? Uh, there, are, there are many people in the chat uh, praising your experience, Paisara. They have worked with you. Mm -hmm. I think Barbara Dresner. Dresner. Yeah, Barbara, please, would you like to cheat? Barbara is Jewish, Catholic, and she's been mm -hmm. number one at the forefront of this festival. And this is what's unique about our, the whole idea concept of Muslims and non-Muslims coming to, it's enriched her world and it's enriched our festival. Barbara, are you able to say a few words? Yes, if, can you hear me okay? We yes, can. yes, you're welcome. Well, I have been lucky enough to have been involved in MacFest from the beginning. And I can't tell you how much it has enriched my life. Um, I'm always, I've always been somebody from, I'm a, from a mixed background, so I want to know about other people from other backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And Kezra is, um, what can I say, <laughs> a bottomless well of joy and education and learning and encouragement and inspiration. And um, that's why I'm here today. Look at me, you know, aren't I lucky to be here today? So 
thank you to Kezra and thank, thank you, you for being here. You all for having me. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you have uh, not not just you have but you are doing great work in empowering Muslim women through art and literature, which is actually the motto of this gathering, isn't it, Hatun? And I hope um, members of this audience will continue to support us and join us for the next uh, round, which will yes. start in October. If you haven't given us your email, please do so. So my colleague Hatun and I will congregate. We have uh, a, a rich program for next round that we will share with our network. Um, I think we need to bring this session to a close. And thank you all. Thank you first, uh, Sister Kaisra, for this wonderful work, not only in this uh, uh, moment where you are presenting everything you have done, but I have always known you as an active woman. I, I can't catch up with you, <laughs> sincerely. You are always doing things and uh, a, wealth, a wealth of opportunities for uh, Muslim people in the diaspora, because this is where Muslim people really need somewhere uh, to feel like, you know, it, 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 it uh, nourishes them culturally, religiously, um, politically, historically, everything. It's, it's really a, a great um, uh, enterprise, I would call it. It's not a small thing, it's, it's a huge thing, so, mm -hmm. which is great and benefits uh, the community and also benefits um, non-Muslims in the community in terms of coming to learn the you know the lives of true Muslims and, and how they are uh, spreading honey and not hate as is your slogan. Yeah thank you. Thank but you I, very much. Maybe yeah. Hatun you have something to say? I, then... I just uh, second uh, all what you have said and I would like to thank Faisra uh, for this contribution and for all what she She's doing uh, for uh, Muslims in, in the UK and uh, everywhere. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, we will meet maybe uh, uh, in one of, uh, of these uh, for, uh, coming events uh, and we can uh, enjoy uh, the festivals uh, in China. Yeah. Inshallah, you will be involved, inshallah. And I've uh, spoken to Sister Zahia. We are thinking of... Uh, having a conference on Muslim women creators and I think it'd be great to partner with you mm -hmm. people. We need an academic platform for that particularly mm -hmm. and to host some of the academics who are working in the creative industry. So inshallah, they, and of course, I want to have a huge admiration for you ladies. Mm -hmm. The work you do is phenomenal. Academic work, working at the university at the top level, you are making a difference. And we need women like you. And this series that you've created itself is unique, it's wonderful. It provides platform for sessions like this. So with, without you two, we wouldn't be here today, would we? <laughs> so my grat gratitude to both of you. And I've hosted sisters here already in the festival and she made an amazing contribution to one of our panel. And it's fantastic to have Muslim women in the Western world university and making a difference. And she's, of course, in Thank Manchester, you. which is even more wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. On this, Thanks I would say all, goodbye. Uh, bye -bye. Thanks to all our attendees. Of course. Yeah. Yes, thank you yeah. very much. And, and some of them have been here at every session. Randy, Elena, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who have joined us today. Hope you will be faithful to our program. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sister. We can stop the recording. Oh, yes.